this is the reason why we want to be like an insurance business as opposed to a customer of an insurance company. Of course, we all need insurance, you know, like, uh, you know, we have medical insurance for those of you uh, who drive, you have to take car insurance, you might, you know, uh, take insurance for your household goods or even, you know, uh, life insurance. But when you think like an insurance business and here you realize that the whole life policy is something which is actually very easy for insurance businesses to sell because they make it sound very attractive. And imagine all that money while the sum assured or the cash surrender value that they're offering is probably a small percentage of what they themselves are making. And that is the reason it is a well-run insurance business, an extremely attractive insurance business. So for those of you who are not familiar with how an insurance business works, I'll just give you a quick primer. Again, our subscribers are already familiar with this. Now, there are two main functions in an insurance business. You can say two main departments. One is the underwriting function, which basically writes the policies. And we have some actuaries here. So, you know, they know very well their job to evaluate and underwrite an insurance policy. When an insurance company sells a policy, it brings in the premium, which is a cash inflow that they bring in. And then they have their own expenses for running the company and uh, they pay out the claims. However, there is a long time lag between the payout of the claim and the premium inflow. This time lag could be several years or sometimes even several decades, depending upon what type of insurance it is. For example, in case of the term insurance that we saw, it can be several decades or the claim might never happen. What the insurance company does in the meantime is that cash, which is available to them after all their immediate expenses, they use that to invest. And they basically pass it on to their investing arm and the investing arm uses that cash to invest. So they basically take advantage of this large time lag between the claims and the premium inflow. And this is called the float and they invest the float and they uh, make money. For those of you who are familiar with Berkshire Hathaway, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, they have several insurance company. And, and this is a snapshot from uh, one of Buffett's letters to his shareholder. This is the letter which came out in 2020. Uh, so let me just read this part. This collect now, pay later model leaves PNC company, that is property and casualty uh, companies holding large sums, money we call float, that will eventually go to the others. Meanwhile, insurers get to invest this float for their own benefit. Though individual policies and claims come and go, the amount of float an insurer holds usually remains fairly stable in relation to the premium volume. Consequently, as our business grows, so does the float. And how it has grown, as the following table shows. So in 1970, Berkshire had a total float of $39 million. Now that has grown by 3,300 times to almost $129 billion, $129.5 billion. So, and this is a secret of Buffett's success, which a lot of people don't realize. And this is something which you know we have talked about in the past also, that Buffett's portfolio is available for public to view. It is not as if he identified investment opportunities, which no one could. Guys, those opportunities were available to a lot of people. You know, Coca-Cola is a public company, Coca-Cola, American Express, etc. But it's his genius is using this free money to invest, you know, as a source of funding. And unlike most other insurance companies, uh, Berkshire, Berkshire's insurance companies, they invest in equity, in, in common equity. And that is what has, you know, compounded his wealth over time. And this is why we like to be an insurance company too. Now, we do not have license to run an insurance company. Uh, you know, I don't have a license from MAS, but the good news is that everybody, each of you can have your own insurance company and you can replicate exactly the same business model using options. Now, in case of an option, also we bring in premium as cash and, you know, we have our expenses, even though our expenses are very, very low. But the difference is in case of an insurance company, when a claim event happens, where you remember here, it was the claim event, the money goes out of the system. But in our case, this premium comes in and we not only get to invest this premium, the money never goes out of the system. Our claim event is equivalent to, let's say when we sell an insurance, the equivalent is we sell a put option. Claim event is that we get assigned on the put option and we just own the stock and the stock stays in the system. So this is brilliant way to use options and this is not option trading you know most people that use options all the other option course that you find in the market they're all talking of option trading they're speculating on the direction of the stock stock price and they're trying to you know make a quick buck whereas 
we use options the way Warren Buffett uses options. He elegantly explained in his 2008 uh, shareholder letter, which is basically the exact same structure of an insurance business, using float while we are waiting. Now, I'm going to share an actual options strategy uh, that is Stoneco. When we were researching Stoneco, it was uh, towards the second half of 2020, and our research happens over several months and sometimes even years, because we think like long-term business owners. So we would like to know everything that is out there to learn about a business. So while we were researching the business, the share price just kept going up and up and up and up. So we were not too happy because you know we wanted uh, to buy the company and our uh, range of intrinsic value per share, it is always a range, intrinsic value is never a precise amount. It was somewhere between 45 to 55, roughly. So we would be okay buying at 55, we would be happy to buy at 45. But by the time we realized that this is the intrinsic value, look where the share price was. The share price had you know, crossed $90. So we decided to patiently wait because we never ever believe in chasing the share price. We know that you know we will get, as a long-term business owner, we know we will get opportunities in future. So even if we don't buy today at 50, maybe a few years down the line, we can buy it at 60 or 70 or maybe even 100. Again, apply the concept of time value of money. If the intrinsic value of the business is growing at a rate of, uh, let's say, 15% or 20%, so the value of today's $50 would be uh, maybe you know, $100 uh, a few years uh, from now, you know, applying the same concept of time value of money. So we have no problem in waiting. And instead, what we did was we decided to sell a put option at 55 strike, which generated a nice cash flow for us. Now, by doing that, we took on the obligation of buying Stoneco at $55 a share. This is screenshot from the uh, software that we use to track all our options programs. So just follow the cursor here. So we, on 16th March, we sold a long-term put option. We sold nine contracts of, of this option uh, at $55 uh, strike. And this option has 675 days to expiry. And in the process, I brought in $12.50 per contract. So brought in a total cash inflow of $11,250, which is available to us as an insurance business, we would like to invest this because it's available to us for 675 days. Now, in the process, I took an obligation of buying Stoneco at $55. So one thing to, one very important thing to highlight here that we never believe in buying on margin. So if we have taken that obligation, we would like to keep the cash aside. So the total capital reserve for a possible assignment of my option is nine contracts multiplied by 100 because every option contract controls 100 shares. So 900 multiplied by 55, which is 49,500. So this money, rather than just leaving it in the bank and on close to zero interest rate, we kept it aside and we, we sold this put option. So the cash inflow from the option premium was again nine multiplied by 100 multiplied by 12.5, which is 11,250. Now, there are two ways of thinking about this option premium. One way of thinking is that I can just sit on this option premium without doing anything. And I can think that at least I have, by selling this put, I have brought down my uh, break even to 42.5. Or the other way is my capital is 49,500. And this 11,250 is my return on that capital, the return that I achieved for 675 days. So on an annualized basis, if I calculate the IRR, it works out to 15% IRR. When we look at a business, our minimum targeted return, that is long-term return after we own the business is at least a 15%. This return will happen, this return of 15% will happen if by Jan 2023, if the Stoneco share price stays above 55. So then we will not get the shares, but we have at least secured this return for uh, you know close to two years, 675 days. However, if Stoneco share price falls below $55 by the expiry of the option, then similar to the insurance uh, terminology, a claim event happens and we are obligated to buy the stock at $55 a share. So in option terminology, it's called an assignment. But is that not what we anyway wished for in the first place? So it's actually a great outcome for us. Unlike an insurance company, when an insurance company receives a huge claim, they have to pay out the claim. Whereas for us, you know, on the assignment, we ended up owning the stock at $55, which we wanted to do in the first place. And moreover, we get to invest the 11,250 cash uh, inflow, which we received by selling the put for 675 days. So isn't it amazing?
And this is the reason why when Buffett first got to know about how an insurance business works from Lorimer Davidson, CFO of Geico, he had a major aha moment. And I learned from Buffett how an insurance business works and how we can use options exactly similar to an insurance business. It was my aha moment. Now, following this exact strategy, this is how our monthly cash flows look like. Now, I have been using this strategy for a long time, but since April 2017, I have recorded every single uh, option transaction of ours, and this shows the cash flows. We would have started with around uh, close to four five thousand dollars a month, and see how it has beautifully uh, grown. And if you take the average of this, it works out to you know sixteen seventeen thousand dollars every month. I mean, there are some months where I have been uh, brought in a cash flow of you know one hundred thirty five thousand dollars. You know, this is about uh, sixty five seventy thousand dollars. So, so this is how we use options to bring in this cash flow, which is a flow. The red bars are not losses. By the way, this is not PNL. This is just a cash flow that we bring in. The red months are simply because in these months we probably purchased uh, more options because of some opportunities than what we sold. But on an average, this is how it looks like: beautifully growing. And on a cumulative basis, uh, since April 2017, this is the last uh, about four years, uh, we have brought in a total amount of cash flow of about 700,000 US dollars. Now that is our float, which was not our money, but it was available to us for investing and. By investing that float, the future value of that float would have grown significantly more. You know, we are trying to do the same strategy, but a few zeros are missing in, in our case when I compare it with Berkshire's float. But hey, we are following the footsteps of the master, you know. So, uh, so if I religiously, you know, follow the same uh, strategy, I know that a few decades from now, this can be a very significant amount. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, plain and simple compounding. It's it's a math. Now. This is what actually happened in case of Stoneco. So I showed you that uh, you know when uh, we finished our research at that time, Stoneco was at ninety dollars. But and we also know the reason why the share price has come down. Now this is a fantastic outcome for us. Now our put option is still there, so we still have the obligation of buying Stoneco uh, if the share price remains below fifty-five. But you know we are happy to because we have kept the cash. But thanks to the float, the copious amount of float that we bring in, we are now able to take advantage of the market price, which is way below our range of intrinsic value. And we have been buying stone coal. So you see, IB even shows, uh, has marked it. This is my average purchase price, and which is, I think, around $38, which is way below intrinsic value. And again, if you understand the principle of compounding and time value of money, if purchasing the stock at $50, I can expect a long-term return of 15 20%. Then purchasing it at thirty-eight dollars, my long-term return will be even higher. That is the reason why, when you know stock prices of one of our businesses come down for whatever temporary reason, this is when we celebrate. This is when we pop the champagne. Now, this picture is in the spirit of uh, transparency, and uh, you know our subscribers know that I always feel that I have invited you to this webinar, and many of you don't know me. So, you know, why should you listen to me unless? Uh, I actually have something to uh, maybe uh, share my experience. Now, this is the actual PNL, the current PNL of my option portfolio uh, using that same float. So I showed you that we brought in seven hundred thousand dollars of cash flow, and you can see that my PNL is currently my option portfolio PNL using that same float is sitting at two point almost two point six million dollars, and a large part of that. Is thanks to that flow, the money which you know uh, which I'm using to invest. Now, the thing is, this is just to demonstrate. I'm not trying to brag uh, by showing this. I'm just showing you what a systematic strategy, you know, following it in a disciplined way, uh, what it can uh, do when you use the simple principles of compounding, and that is exactly what has happened. And you can see there are several reds. You know, several positions are are in the red, which is which is absolutely fine. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is what's going to happen in the long term. And uh, you know, some of you who have uh, seen me present know that you know this number is extremely volatile. So this is also not something which is anything to brag about. There was a point of time it used to be above three million dollars. It has even gone down to uh, you know negative during the COVID period. It's extremely volatile, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we think like long term business owners. And you know you will see that there are some long positions here, like OZK. Here you can see Stone Stock long position. 
So, uh, so some of these were, you know, either my puts got exercised or I managed to use the float to go and buy it from the market. All right, using the same float, I'm going to share with you some great opportunities which we were able to capitalize just because we had access to that cash flow. Now, those of you from Singapore are very familiar with this company. This has been the best performing Singapore stock. And uh, we have, in fact, I was, you know, through some filter criteria, I identified this particular uh, stock in somewhere mid of 2018 and have been researching this uh, ever since. My first entry point was at $1.12. But last COVID time, even though this looks like a small uh, groove, a small blimp, but actually this was a uh, over 50% drop. Uh, you know, in relative terms, you can't make out now. And the share price had dropped to below 70 cents. And thanks to the availability of float, I managed to heavily purchase here. And this has now become a nine bagger uh, for me. And you can see many of you know, uh, most of these people here uh, are friends from Jim. So we actually have this IFAS discussion group, which has been going on for many years now. You can even see the date of this discussion, 13 Jan, 2019. So we have been in, uh, you know, following this company in detail, researching this company, uh, you know, with, with these guys uh, since 2018, we have gone, uh, we attend the AGMs, meet the CEO. So this is how deeply we, we look at a business when we like the business. Some other examples, this is a company in India, which I've been owning for a long time. This again has been a seven bagger. So again, the same thing, you know, uh, our initial purchase happened below a uh, thousand rupees, but uh, you know, when the share price dropped, availability of float allowed us to buy more. Uh, so seven baggers here, a fairly significant uh, position. JD.com, we have been buying since it was uh, around $30. And many of the guys uh, that you saw in the picture, we also researched JD.com together. Uh, kept buying till it was at $19. And uh, as of yesterday, it's about $85 uh, now. So again, a very good result. But then you know what, I'm not showing this to the brag about the share price uh, run up because we uh, think of ourselves as long term business owners, I will be unless something is fundamentally wrong uh, with the business, I will be owning these businesses for maybe decades, you know, unless there's a significantly better opportunity that comes up. So it actually helps me when the stock price uh, goes down like here or here allows me to uh, you know uh, buy more as compared to the stock price running up always it does not you know run up in the in the short term china maple leaf is one company which we researched extensively unfortunately the share price has not uh, done well because of all the china risks and all but uh, china maple leaf i recently had some concerns and i had published that in a video that has got nothing to do with the share price going down in fact the share price going down can be a good thing but there are some other reasons i think their uh, international expansion st strategy uh, you know they are not generating enough cash internally to to support that which means their balance sheet is going to get uh, weaker and weaker so i have published a video uh, uh, about that but then we never like uh, acting in a haste i mean uh, upwork had followed exactly the same trajectory uh, when we researched the company. After I bought Upwork, the share price had, uh, you know, fallen to half. But uh, just because we are patient and just because we understand the business inside out, uh, and you know, we have the availability of the float to take advantage of the share price drop, see what happened. So this new position has already become an eight bagger uh, for me. Now, what kind of a track record, overall track record? Uh, does all this translate into over time? Now, I showed you, uh, you know, the option portfolio, but that's just a snapshot of the current uh, time period. Our investment track record of my early years of investing looked like, and I'm not trying to be cute here. I'm not trying to be funny here. This is the actual chart from my very early days of investing. And as you can see, it doesn't look pretty at all. This is, you know, during the financial crisis. And uh, this was a result of a lot of ego I think that was the biggest culprit. You know, I had a very successful career, did extremely well in my uh, job and I used to have a, a full-time job. And uh, this is a very common problem with people who are otherwise successful, they have. It's very difficult for them to accept the fact that success in one field does not guarantee a success in another field. And the investing domain is really funny. I mean, just because you're a very accomplished piano player, uh, it does not give you the false uh, delusion that you can also be uh, good at chess, right? Or you can also be good at uh, maybe uh, brain surgery. But for some reason, uh, you know, all successful uh, people, they somehow get this notion that, oh, you know what, we should be good at investing also. And they try a lot of funny stuff. It was also a result of not understanding the fundamental difference between price and value. 
and being focused only on stock prices. It was a result of overtrading, not appreciating the concept of compounding and time value of money, superficial knowledge on companies. I did not invest the, that is, I'm talking of my early years, did not invest the time and research to build conviction. And I used to pay a lot of attention to the noise. So an equivalent of the US-China trade war, I would dig up all possible articles and keep reading and keep trying to speculate, oh, you know what, this is what is going to happen. This is uh, what the world is going to come to an end. And, and all that noise, it first of all, it adds absolutely no value to our lives. It just messes up with our mind. And last but not the least, I was delusional. Now, fast forward to uh, today, this is how the last five years, I always believe that any track record, anything below five years is, is uh, not worth looking at because uh, you know one can be lucky, but the over time, I think luck factor goes down and you can see the blue bars are mine and the green are SPX. So this is five year track record. And as you can see, S&P 500 has returned uh, close to 16%, but uh, my return has been uh, significantly better than that, you know, almost 21%. And this is, you know, again, not trying to boast here, but this is on a uh, pretty sizable, you know, uh, portfolio, eight figure portfolio. So it's, I think, fairly, fairly satisfactory track record, I must say. And uh, this happened because I was committed to learn to invest the right way and follow the right framework, develop the ability to identify and research high quality businesses, ability to generate cash flows to take advantage of the best opportunities, very important. Even more important is develop the right temperament, gain control on my emotions, especially when the markets are very volatile. And last but not the least, developing an understanding of all the other non-sexy secrets of compounding wealth. Because I understood quite early in the day, and to a big extent, I must thank uh, Warren Buffett for that, that if you want to be a successful long-term investor, you know we are all talking of uh, long-term is multiple decades for us. Uh, for many of you who are, you know, early in your, uh, maybe in your 20s, uh, it'll probably be a seven decade lo uh, long investment uh, horizon. So it's not only going and, uh, you know, scouting through the 13 apps to see what Munish Fabra is buying or what Lilu is buying. It's much more than that. Deep understanding of many of these non-sexy secrets play a very important role in that. If you found this video interesting, then you should definitely join our research platform. It's completely free to join. There are no hidden costs. And that's where we publish our free research on several high quality businesses, which are typically compounders. The link to join is available in the description section below. And I also welcome you to join our Facebook group called the Investment Forum. That's a place where we discuss these high quality businesses with several other DIY serious investors. And you will benefit from the discussion, I'm pretty sure. And if you enjoyed this video, can I please request you to hit the like button and do subscribe to our channel. It does not cost you a penny, but it'll really help us with the YouTube algorithm. And we will be able to notify you whenever we are coming up with other interesting videos on company research or other investment concepts. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for your time.